group of Psalms, uh, 120 through 134, I believe it's 134, that uh, you'll find underneath the, uh, underneath the heading of the Psalm that uh, it is a song of degrees. Uh, the word degrees means a song of ascent. Ascent means going up. And these, uh, these particular Psalms were used by the children of Israel when they on feast days, went up to Jerusalem. Jer Jerusalem was up on a hill uh, somewhat. And as they went up, they would sing these psalms for whatever feast day they were going there to Jerusalem to be a part of. This 122nd psalm uh, is uh, really is a, is a song for the church. It, it is really... It ties in with the message I preached uh, Sunday morning on God's glorious church and the importance of the church. You got your Bible open, uh, follow along as I read these uh, nine verses. David said, and by the way, we note here that this is the first of these Psalms that uh, we're told who the author is, and this is David. I was glad, David said, when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is builded as a city that is compact together. Whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, under the testimony of Israel, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls, and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, Peace be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Let's pray, and then we'll look at a few thoughts out of this, uh, this great 122nd Psalm. Father, uh, thank you for church on Wednesday night and for your people. Uh, Lord, what a blessing to be here. All over this city, there are churches just like this church that have met tonight. They have sung hymns as we have sung. They've opened the word as we're opening the word. And they're looking to you as we're looking to you to speak to their hearts. Lord, without you and without your ministering presence, then our, our time here will be no value at all. If we're not here to hear from God, if we didn't come to this place tonight to hear from our Heavenly Father, then uh, it's meaningless time. And I, and I pray our hearts will be open for that tonight. Holy Spirit, speak and move my heart. Help me to draw closer to you, even as, as I have in studying these verses this week. Meet needs in this room tonight, especially I pray if there's spiritual need, help that one to say yes to you. We'll thank you and praise you for all you do. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. David is the author of this psalm. You'll notice Psalm 24, 124, another of David's psalms. Uh, those that have not an author listed are believed to have been written by, by Hezekiah. We don't know for sure, but uh, there's good reason to believe that. The opening verse of this psalm immediately focuses our attention on the house of the Lord. David says, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. If you study God's word at all, if you study through the Bible, Old Testament or New Testament, you will find the principle, you will find the practice of God's people gathering together in the presence of the Lord in a house, a temple, a place of worship dedicated to him for that purpose of cooperate praise and worship. In fact, it is taught that the Word of God teaches us that as the people of God, we all together, as we have gathered here this evening. David said back in Psalms 84 and verse 10, For a day in thy courts, a day in thy presence, a day in thy courts is better than the thousands. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. Then he says here in this psalm about the, the gladness that it brings to his heart to be in God's house. We come to the New Testament chap, in Matthew chapter 18 and verse 20. Jesus is speaking and he says something to us about the matter of corporate prayer. 
Now, there cannot be cooperate prayer. Uh, the best place to have cooperate prayer is in the house of God. And he said, again, I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. For where, here it is, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. In Luke chapter 4 and verse 16, the Bible says, and he is talking of Jesus. And Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, this is the Lord Jesus. We know he's the son of God. We know he's God in the flesh. We know there's no greater example of godliness and holiness than, than that of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sit up for to read. Going to the synagogue was a practice of the Lord Jesus Christ. Luke 24, verses 52 and 53, the Bible says in they, talking about the disciples. Now this is after the resurrection, after the ascension. The Bible says in they worshiped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy and were continually in the temple praising and blessing God. Amen. Then we get to the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 46 and 47. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Acts chapter 20 and verse 7, And upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them. Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse 2, Upon the first day of the week, that's Sunday, that's the Lord's day. Upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God hath prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. So this, this principle, this, this, uh, this truth concerning uh, participating in corporate worship is taught all through the Word of God. The spiritual life of Israel was to be focused, first of all, upon the tabernacle. Uh, and that's a great study. And, and then from the tabernacle, when the temple was built, their, 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 their spiritual life was to be focused there in the temple. It was there in the tabernacle and there in the temple that they met with Jehovah. It was there that the presence and the power and the provision of His Spirit became a reality to them. All of the sacrifices, all the symbols that were involved in their worship there in the tabernacle, there in the temple, were designed for one purpose, and that purpose was to emphasize the power and the presence of the living God. If you haven't done a tabernacle study as a, as a Christian, you ought to do that because everything God gave to them was an object lesson of the presence and power of Almighty God. And of course, all of that in the tabernacle and the temple pointed to the day when the real sacrifice would be made, the living Christ, the, the, the Lord Jesus Christ would come. He would die on the cross for the sins of the world, be buried, and would rise again and uh, promise to meet with his people until he comes again. And at this point, as we study the New Testament, the focus of worship moved from the temple. If you remember that, that veil that hung in the temple that separated uh, the, the holy place from the holy of holies. Uh, nobody but the high priest could go there. When, when, when Jesus died, that temple was rent, saying that the way now had been opened up to God. Listen, you, you just, listen, it's hard for us to wrap our minds around the, the wonder of you and I being able to come here and enter into the presence of holy God tonight. If you had... If you had been Moses, if you had been Joshua, if you'd been David in the Old Testament, you would not have had this privilege that you and I have tonight. Well, because of what Christ did at Calvary, the way's been open. And uh, as he rose, as he rose from the grave and went back to heaven, the focus of our worship moved from the temple to the New Testament church. The day of Pentecost uh, uh, and the indwelling presence of, of the Holy Spirit. We're living, we're living in a time of endless change. I don't know how you are, but I, 
older I get, the more I dislike change. Man, I, I, these uh, grocery stores, about every six months, uh, move everything around. I don't like that. Somebody ought to tell them folks, you need to leave everything alone right where it is because us old people can't find it when you move it around. We don't like change. Change is not something that we enjoy, but we're living in a time of almost endless change. And unfortunately, in the midst of that, we have filled our schedules with activities that have such a demand on our time, whether it's personally in our lives or whether it's with our children or our grandchildren, we have filled our lives up with so many activities that we no, longer, we no longer see church as an essential part of our lives. In fact, there are a lot of folks who call themselves Christian today who will tell you that they feel like the church is irrelevant, that it's, that it's not as significant as it has been in days past. I know folks who, with the help of the devil, have convinced themselves that they can be just as good a Christians at home as they go on, can go into church. In fact, I've had people tell me that. Let me tell you, one of, the, one of the most grotesque abnormalities in this world is an unchurched Christian. To call yourself a Christian and not be in, involved in church is an absolute abnormality. We talk about two-headed cows and two-headed snakes and those being abnormal things. Listen, that, that, that doesn't even approach the abnormality of a Christian who is not faithful to the house of God. In fact, the one who is saved, listen, if you're saved, you, you cannot fulfill what it means to be a Christian apart from the church. It's impossible to do that. Absolute active membership becomes the indispensable mark of salvation. People, people are going to mark you by your faithfulness to the house of God. And if you're not faithful to the house of God, they're going to mark you as a part of this work. If you study the New Testament, you'll find that it reveals no such thing as an unchurched Christian. Read it. It's there. All the way through the book of Acts, read, read everything that Paul has to say. There, there's no such thing revealed in the New Testament as an unchurched Christian. Why? Because the church lies at the very heart, at the very center of God's eternal purpose. Listen, God put this church here for a purpose, and that purpose is to be a witness to him in, in a wicked world of the saving grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when you and I are not faithful to that, then, then we're not fulfilling our purpose as the people of God. I want us for just a few minutes this evening to look at the verses of this psalm, and, and, and I want us to notice some very important things that we find here at the house of the Lord. The psalmist, you, there are a lot of things you could mention out of this psalm, but uh, there, there are three, three things that, we find, that, I, that I've listed here that I find at the house of the Lord that, that we so desperately need. First of all, in the Lord's house, there's great joy. You see that right in verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. David talks about two things for, here. First of all, he talks about his delight. The temple of Jerusalem was the place where God promised to meet his people. You read the Old Testament, you'll find that when it was finished, when, they, when, when Solomon followed the instructions that were given David and, and finished it up and dedicated it, the Shekinah glory of God came and inhabited that place. Now, God's Shekinah glory does not come and inhabit this building today. You do understand that in the Old Testament, the Spirit of God did not indwell individuals. But today, you and I are the church. We are the church. We're the, we're the dwelling place of the living God today. But you go back to the Old Testament and, and uh, the, when, when God's Shekinah glory came there, that was an indication of, uh, of their need of being there to be in the presence of the Lord. 
David's heart was in the worship of God. And he was delighted. He, he expresses that here when he found others inviting him to go where his desires had already gone. He, he wanted to be there. And all of a sudden, somebody comes by and says, hey, let's go to the house of the Lord. I know there's a difference between the, the temple of the Old Testament and the church house of the New Testament. But the Lord has given a special promise concerning our attendance in the house of the Lord. We read it there a moment ago. Jesus said, for where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst of them. Now, I know, I know God is everywhere. Uh, somebody said, where does God live? God's everywhere. God, you cannot go where God is not. But there is, a, there, there is a special promise, a very special promise given to God's people that where two or three of them gather together in cooperate worship, that, that he's going to be there. Listen, he's in this place tonight. He's here tonight. He's near me. He's near you in this place tonight. I know he lives within us, but there is a special manifestation of God's presence promised to us if we gather here in this place with a desire to worship him. Brother Spurgeon said, Our gladness at the bare thought of being in God's house is detective as, our, as to our character and prophetic of our being one day happy in the Father's house on high. I wonder if you aren't going to be happy in the Lord's house here or are you going to be happy in the Lord's house there? Let me ask you tonight, are, are, are are you delighted when time comes to be in the house of the Lord? Does it aggravate you when somebody reminds you that you ought to be in church? <laughs> Do you get frustrated? Well, you ought not to. You, you, you ought to be happy that somebody would even remind you that you need to be in church. Da, da, notice David's words here. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. <laughs> let us. Let, let's go. I, not, no, I'm not sending you, but we're going together. By, by the way, you can, t you, you can take many more people to church than you can send, by the way. Of all the places on earth where there ought to be gladness, church stands at the top. The, 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 the happiest time in our lives, the happiest place in our lives ought to be a church. If it's not, and, and I know who I am, and I, you, you, and I have an idea, you're like I am, and, and you deal with the same old flesh that I deal with. There are times when I have to really get George in the corner and talk to him somewhere, but, but I'm telling you tonight, the happiest place on the face of planet Earth ought, ought to, for us as God's people ought to be when we get in the house of God. I read this little poem that sort of goes along with this. It says, don't grouch, but smile. What good did it do to be grouchy today? Did your surliness drive any trouble away? Did you cover more ground than you usually do because of the grouch you carried within you? If not, what's the use of a grouch or a frown? If it won't, if it won't smooth a path or a painful trouble drown, if it doesn't assist you, it isn't worthwhile. You work maybe hard, but just do it and smile. <laughs> I was glad, David said, when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. By the way, do you know where that joy comes from? We're talking about the real thing now. We're not, we're not, we're not talking about getting happy because you're going to Chick-fil-A and getting an ice cream after church or something of that nature. We're talking about real joy. We're talking about something that lasts. Titus is happy right now. He's got a truck. I, I see the smile on his face when he drives in. <laughs> And I'm excited for him. Man, I remember, I remember my, do you remember your first car, brother? I remember my first car. I remember the first time I drove by myself. What an exciting time that was. But I won't tell you what's going to happen. Put your hands over your ears, Titus. <laughs> I can tell you what's going to happen. It won't be long till the joy's going to be off of that. It's like buying a, a new house. Boy, you're so excited about a new house. It don't take long. When the water heater breaks down and the, and the sink drain goes to leaking, the commode won't flush until all joy is gone out of that. I can tell you, if you're going to find real joy in this world, it's going to have to come from the Lord. And his desire is to give us that joy. We become full of joy and peace when we trust him. The more we trust, the greater the joy in our lives. So David, David first of all, talks about his delight. And then in verse 2, he talks about his determination. He said, our feet shall stand 
within thy gates. Notice, notice the word shall there. He, did, he doesn't say maybe our feet are going to be there, but, but our feet shall stand. The city of Jerusalem is of vital importance in the counsels of God. Write it down. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, <laughs> in fact, if, if you and I were privileged to look into heaven tonight, we would see that, 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 that Jerusalem is the bullseye on God's, God's map tonight. The truth is there's, not a, there's never been another city in all of history like the city of Jerusalem. You, you, can see, you can see that importance the number of times that God mentions it in his word. Some 489 times he mentions it in over 800 references to that city. God has things to say about Jerusalem that he never says about any other city in the world. He calls it the city of the great king, Psalms 48, 1 and 2. He calls it the city of God, Psalms 46 and verse 4. He calls it the holy city, Isaiah 48 and verse 2. The pilgrim standing within the gate of Jerusalem was standing where history was made. Standing in a city with a continuous recorded history dating all the way back to the days of Abraham and Melchizedek. Now tell me in another city in the world where you can trace its history back to there. You can't find anything in the U.S. like that. No wonder the, the pilgrim would pause as he entered the gates of Jerusalem just to, just to soak up the atmosphere. What a place this Jer, Jer, place Jerusalem was. By the way, I'm told, I've never been to Israel, but I'm told even today as, as modern visitors go, they're amazed at the, at the city. I, I'd remind you tonight as a child of God, that the church is also of vital and significant importance to God. Jerusalem's important because of its uh, relationship to his people, but the church is important because of its relationship to his people, the church. In Ephesians 5 and verse 25, Paul said, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. Is God concerned about the church? Sure he is. Who did he give his life for? The church. Colossians 1.18, and he, Christ, is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. I, I realize that uh, the bricks and the concrete and the, and the lumber and the sheetrock and the carpet do not make up the church. But in reality, they are symbolic of the Lord's church in this world. Whenever people think about the church, they, they think of a building. And I, I know this building has a heart. It, it's not alive at all until you and I get here. When we neglect, when we forsake the place that has been designated for the gathering of God's people, then in reality, we are forsaking the church, God's people. When I... When I play around with, with, my, with my relationship to the church and, and uh, I plan my schedule around being away from the church for no good reason at all. Now, I'm not talking about folks who have deaths and people taking a vacation. Dear Lord, those things are all a part of life. But I'm talking about just for any whim whatsoever. Well, I just, don't, I, I just feel like staying at home this morning. What we're doing when we do that we're forsaking the place that has been designated for the gathering of God's people. In reality, what we're doing, we're forsaking God's people. We, we're, 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 we're playing upon, uh, upon them. David had a great respect and love for the house of the Lord. Do you? Not only do we find great joy in the house of the Lord, he mentions here, but then he mentions two other things, and I'll mention them quickly, and, and we, we'll be done. First, first of all, the Lord's house... We find great joy. Secondly, we in the Lord's house, there's much praise, gratitude. Look, look at verses 3, 4, and 5. In these verses, he calls attention to two things. First of all, the building. Look at verse 3. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. If you go back to 1 Samuel, you, you'll find that God gave to David a vision of the city Jerusalem. And of the temple that was to be built there. God was the divine architect of the city. 
Notice, notice the word compact there in verse 3. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. The buildings are, are built one against another. It literally means joined together. It, 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 it's not erected as a set of booths or a conglomeration of temporary tents, but as a city designed, arranged, and, and defended, built together. And it gives to us a, a picture here of uh, what the Lord intended for the church. I talked about it Sunday morning there in Matthew 16, 18. Jesus said, I will build my church. The Psalms chapter 127 and verse 1, uh, the psalmist said, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain to build it. Anything that's not built uh, upon uh, a, a scriptural basis is not a church. It may be an entertainment uh, uh, venue. It may be a lot of other things, but it's not a church. The Bible refers to you and I as believers as a part of the body of Christ. We're a body. All of us fulfilling a, a different part of the body of Christ. Just like the members of my body all fulfill different uh, functions. My ears to hear, my eyes to see, my mouth to speak, my feet to walk, my hands to, to lift, to carry. The, that They all carry out a, a purposeful function. Well, hear me tonight, beloved. Every single one of us, every one of us from the youngest to the oldest, if we are saved... We are an intricate part of the body of Christ and he saved us to fulfill a particular responsibility in the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when we don't occupy that place and there's going to be an area where there's going to be a, 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 a lack. There's going to be something missing. The church is a permanent and important, I hesitate to even use the word institution. The church is an not even an organization, it's an organism, it's a living thing that is founded on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul talked about that in Ephesians 2, 21 and 22 when he said, In whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. The psalmist talks about the building first of all here, but then in verses 4 and 5 he talks about the blessing. He says, whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, under the testimony of Israel, give thanks in the name of the Lord. For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. It was a joyous thing for the people of God to make their way to Jerusalem, to the temple, to worship together. Coming from different backgrounds, coming from different jobs, doing this and doing that, all of them coming together with the same testimony and the same love for God. The children of Israel were encouraged to go up to the house of the Lord to worship, to give thanks, to offer their praise to God. Now they could offer their praise anywhere, just as I can offer my praise anywhere. You can offer your praise anywhere. But you see, by going up together, they would have a strong reminder of how good God had been to them. <laughs> Look around you tonight. I, I look around here and I, and I, see, I, I see faces of folks and, and, and that encourages me. I, and and I, I know that it, uh, it has to in your life. It's an encouragement to see others and to see how God is blessing, what God has brought them through, how, how the hand of God has helped them in sorrow or in sickness or, 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 or financial debt. Whatever the difficulty has been, God has helped them and it encourages my heart. To meet with the people of God as they share that testimony. They'd be reminded of who they were, God's people. They'd be reminded of God's power, God's authority. But they'd also be reminded of God's judgment and His justice. He talks about uh, a set of thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. The counterpart to what the psalmist is saying here is found in Hebrews 10.25 where the writer of Hebrews says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a matter of some is, and so much more as you see the day approaching. It's winding down. The clock is nearing the midnight hour as far as, as, far as time is concerned. 
And as, this, as, as God's timepiece winds down to that last moment, I'm going to tell you the stress and the difficulty of this world is not going to get any better. It's going to get worse. The devil is as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And I'm going to tell you now, it's, it's going to be hard enough to maintain your faith and, and your composure, child of God, drawing from the strength of God's people. Don't let yourself get, get out on a limb. Don't, 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 don't you let the devil lead you out. Don't, don't you let him lead you out there because if you do, you're going to find yourself in a, in a major spiritual mess. The house of God is a place that we find strength and encouragement to help. The house of God is a place where we can forge links of love with others of like precious faith. Did, did you know the most precious people in the world outside of those that, that are closest to you and your immediate family ought to be those who are part of the family of God that you worship with? You ought to work at, you ought to work at forging, forging links, strong links with, with those who are of like faith if you want to be strengthened and helped in these days. It, it is here in the house of God that Jesus has promised to meet the needs of his assembled saints. It is here that the word of God is going to be expounded. It is here that we pray as a body and share our prayer requests and share our burdens. It's here that we sing the wonderful hymns of the faith. Some years ago now, back during the presidency of Franklin Roosevelt, the telephone rang in the preacher's office of the church there in Washington where the president attended. And when the pastor answered the phone, an eager caller on the other end said, tell me, do you expect the president to be in church this Sunday? <laughs> and the preacher patiently explained, well, that I cannot promise. But we do expect God to be here. And we fancy that will be incentive enough for a reasonably large attendance. We of all people should know what it means to praise God. We ought to know what it means to meet with God. It ought to be our desire to praise Him in every way possible through the singing of hymns, through the prayer time, through the reading of Scripture, through the preaching of God's Word. What do we find down at the house of the Lord? We find a place of great joy, a place of much praise, but then thirdly, lastly, in the Lord's house, there's peace and security. Verses 6, 7, 8, and 9, he talks about that. First of all, I see the prayer that's commanded. Look, at, look in verse number six. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. That's a command. You ought to put that on your prayer list. That ought to be a daily prayer, especially in these days. We ought to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. We already talked about the city. Jerusalem means city of peace, but it has never known peace. In all of its history, it's never known peace. You, you Go back and study the history of Jerusalem. It's amazing that the city has, has survived. I, I mean, what happened in the Old Testament, not even, not even uh, accounting for what's happened in, in, in recent history. 1923, Great Britain officially assumed authority for, for, for Israel. They took it away from the Turks. And then in 1948, the Israelis took control of the nation from the Jordanians and the nation of Israel was formally established. And I can tell you that during the entirety of my lifetime, 79 years, that the struggle has continued for control of that part of the world. Israel has literally struggled for their existence down to this hour. Now, we're not, we're not talking about a nation the size of America. We're, we're talking about a nation with 8,550 square miles. It is about the size of the, the, the state of New Jersey. And yet the whole world wants its hands. Why? Because there's so much wealth that, that is there. We know tonight that during the tribulation period, the Russians are going to surge down toward the city. We know that the Antichrist is going to take it and literally ravish it. We know that armies of the world are going to gather there at Megiddo with one thing in mind, and that's to destroy the city of Jerusalem. But you and I also know that when that happens, the Lord himself is going to come and protect that city. The Lord gave us a priority here of praying for the peace of Jerusalem. 
And I, I believe, I, I don't believe I'm straining this verse when, when I say we ought to pray for the peace of the church. We ought to pray for, we ought to pray for the work of the church. I, I wonder, are you praying for the church? Are you praying for Elizabeth Terrace Baptist Church? Are you asking God? Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he might send forth laborers. Are you praying for the church? Are you praying for Sunday school workers? Are, 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 are you praying for, for somebody to fill the shoes of, of, of those of us who are getting ready to make our transition from this world to the next world? Are, are you praying for the church? And then he not only talks about the, we see the prayer that's commanded, but we see the pre, peace and prosperity that's promised. Look at the last part of verse 6. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. Peace be within thy walls and prosperity within thy palaces. For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, Peace be within thee. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Prosperity is always the fruit of peace. One of the reasons our world has not moved ahead in so many areas is because of the warfare of the world. War, war always, listen, war, warfare always deplenishes the resources of nations. Prosperity that comes in the Lord's church involves the saving of the lost and the discipleship of the saved. We live in a world, I said it a moment ago, where the devil's like a prowling lion looking to devour and destroy people's souls. Jesus said he came to seek and to save that which is lost. The devil came to seek and to destroy. You need to remember that. You, you need to constantly remind yourself of that. Whenever, whenever you think about being unfaithful, remind yourself that, that that thought didn't come from the Lord. You need to recognize where that came from. Consequently, our salvation and our security are in the Lord. And but one place to find peace and security, and that's in him. And that's why we worship Him. In Him and in His house of worship, we find peace and security. What do we find in the house of the Lord, David? We find great joy. We find much praise and gratitude. We find peace and security. I don't know about you, but when I, when I think about all those things, they all, do, do they sound good to you? All those things sound good to me. And, and the wonderful thing is you don't have to have money in the bank in order to buy them. I've been guilty of saying you have to, well, if I had the money, I'd buy such and such. Well, I can tell you the Lord offers us what money can't buy. And those things are, are simply found in worshiping Him. We can make investments, and some investments pay, pay some, others pay more. Banks don't pay, but I can tell you the Lord always pays. You cannot outgive the Lord. When he said, pray for the peace of Jerusalem, here reminded me of, 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 of what he promised to the nation of Israel. I'll bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. What things? Great joy. Much praise and gratitude, peace and security in our lives. Things that so many folks in this world are trying to find tonight, but they're looking in all the wrong places. Would you bow your head with me for a moment tonight? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. As you close your eyes and lift your heart to the Lord tonight, would you, would you just... Would you just exercise in doing that? Would you, would you just close your eyes and say, Now, Lord, I'm looking to you tonight. I want that great joy. I, I, want, that, uh, I want that praise and thankfulness in my life. I, I want that peace and security in my life. Would you ask the Lord for that in your own heart and life tonight? And then would you ask the Lord to help you to be faithful as he's commanded us to be faithful? to the house of God. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the truth of your word and for these moments that we have to digest what you've said to us in, in these verses. I pray for the needs that are here tonight. You'd, you'd help that one who is struggling tonight, Lord. 
that one who's literally on the edge, ready just to drop off. Lord, help them. Help them that a lifeline might be thrown to where they are and they'd come back to where they need to be tonight. Thank you for being here. For your